Hello and good afternoon, everybody. I'm really happy to see that some people are connecting with the translation headphones because I imagine that I will sound at least twice as smart when translated by these ladies. <laughs> but it's great to be here. I was truly delighted when I received the invitation from the conference organizers, so thank you for having me here. I live in Dublin, in Ireland, but I am originally from Liverpool in England. So if anybody knows anything about football, then you would know that Istanbul, for somebody from Liverpool, is a truly wonderful, magical, I would say maybe romantic place because of what happened here in, in 2005. And I only hope that the visitors that you welcomed from my hometown of Liverpool in 2005 were well behaved enough that I'm still welcome here today to be here with you. But I'm not here to talk about football, I'm here to talk about LinkedIn where I work and specifically this 2018 workplace learning report um, that we release. The best way, I think the easiest way to start to describe LinkedIn is with what we call the economic graph. And the economic graph is the digital representation of our mission when we build the platform to connect all of the world's professionals to help them to be more successful and more productive. And the way this works is if you have all of the members, all of the professionals on the platform, all of the companies, all of the jobs within those companies, all of the skills that are required to be great at those jobs or to get those jobs documented on the platform, all of the schools that you could get an education in order to get into the workforce in the, in the first place, overlaid with knowledge which is sharing documents or sharing articles or commenting and discussing, that we would be able to help capital flow within that graph with all of these nodes, whether that's financial capital or intellectual capital or, or opportunity. And that's what we're, we're building in, in LinkedIn. This is not exactly like Dr. Varan's <laughs> presentation, in the, if you saw doctor, the doctor before me. In fact, when I saw uh, LinkedIn mission on this slide, I was thinking, oh no, the doctor is gonna think that I'm formatted. Just so happens to be, I think, a good and worthy mission because it represents opportunity for the people who are on the platform. It represents jobs. It represents dream jobs. It represents getting the job that you want. And that's what, that's what drives me doing what I do. In 2015, LinkedIn acquired lynda.com that you may, be, may have been familiar with as an online course provider. And that was in 2015 the final jigsaw piece in the puzzle here, because up to that point, we could tell somebody what skills were required to get the dream job, or which school should I go to if I want to become an aircraft engineer, or robotics engineer, or which um, people I should connect with if I need a coach or a mentor in order to get to a certain position. But we couldn't tell people that the the way to get, the exact way to get the skills. And so when we acquired lynda.com and plugged it into this economic graph, it felt like, okay, now we can show you the way and here is the, the actual practical way. And that's what I work with. I work with LinkedIn Learning. Good thing about the economic graph I just show you very quickly is that whilst it is a vision, it's a destination, a mission for us, it's really practical today. So of the members, there are 550 million. You could see 7 million there in Turkey. A long way to go, happily. Every second that passes, two more people sign up. And we add more companies and more jobs and more schools and billions of exchanges of knowledge. Of course, in order to build something like that, you need to be able to pay for it. And this is the way that we in LinkedIn 
pay for it. We work with companies, like the companies that you work with, to help them to hire talent, to help them to market generally, to sell. And now, because of lynda.com, we help them to, to learn. And can I just check, of those people who have worked with LinkedIn, who has worked with LinkedIn for hiring or is familiar with LinkedIn for, for hiring? Some for marketing. Anybody who's on LinkedIn, you're aware of the marketing product because you see advertisements. But for learning, is anybody familiar already with LinkedIn Learning or lynda.com? Yeah, great. OK, all right, very good. So when we, we started in 2015 into the learning and development space, and we realized it's complicated. We learned it's complicated. <laughs> And so we started to survey our members. We started to tap into that knowledge ourselves to try and understand it. And in 2017, 2016, 17, and then 18, we started to publish these reports based on what we heard from anybody who would be impacted with, with learning and development profession so that we could understand it more and so that we could share it with that learning and development community that we, we want to become a, a part of. And I'm going to share some of the insights from that today and hopefully spark a few ideas that you might be able to bring back to, to your organization or spark a discussion for, for a break time. We didn't just ask the talent development professionals, though. We wanted to ask the executives in the organizations. We wanted to ask the managers, the people managers in the, the organizations. And probably most importantly, we wanted to ask the employees, the learners, what were, what were they looking for when they're looking to learn? And so we start to answer some of these questions from those four viewpoints. From the talent developers, how are you keeping pace with the rapid change that you need to? For the employees, for the learners, what are you asking for? But then when you get it, when the development and learning professionals give it to you, why don't you engage with it? For the executives, what do you think generally about uh, development? How important is it? How impactful? And then for, for managers, we started to get into this idea that of all of the, the people involved, the, the learners who are recommending learning to each other and learning socially and, and engaging with each other, and of the, the executives who are sponsoring learning, and of the talent professionals who are delivering the learning, have we not activated properly this layer of the first line managers. We wanted to get, get into that. So this, we're going to spend most of the time talking about those things. First of all, the talent developers. How are modern and uh, impactful talent developers staying ahead of the, the change that they need to stay ahead of these days as the organizations are growing and as the skills gaps are growing and as the jobs are being created which didn't exist? in the past? Well, we asked what are, their, are the top priorities. And I think that these won't be particularly surprising for you. Number one, how to train for soft skills. Good news. Everything we heard of today and everything that you've heard at, at similar conferences is around the importance of soft skills. This is consistent when we think back to the economic graph. And we can see in the world all of the jobs that are they're advertised. And we can see all of the skills that all of the members have. The biggest gap today is not a digital technology skill or coding. It's a gap in things like communication, creativity, critical thinking, design thinking, agile. So some, like some of the, the things that Dr. Bram were, were talking about. And you all get that. It's super. So you understand that, and this is number one priority. We need to be consistent in how you deliver the, the training so that everybody could access it in the way they want to access it. And then we need to start to track and assess. So number three, number four, number five, all about um, insights on what is the skills inventory in your organization today, 
How do we see how that skill develops? And how do we see how those skills are being applied? In mo more and more important than ever to be able to assess what's happening to track. And then sixth on this list of things that the talent development community told us was to understand the impact of technology in your world. More and more, the talent professional as a technology professional making sense of all of the different vendors that are out there in a very competitive and fragmented industry when it comes to what you could bring in for, for your learners and how you need to be able to, to work that out. And once you've worked it out, plug it to, in together. And once you plug it in together, how do you drive change to, to adopt it? You have a complicated job. Lucky for us, in a company like LinkedIn, you're embracing the digital transformation, so um, you're uh, engaging with the idea of micro-learning, just-in-time learning, engaging with um, high-quality content, the types of things, the reason why we invested in a, in a, a platform like lynda.com. And at the same time, you're seeing this very seismic shift from the classroom training to the online training world. We're right at the edge of this disruption or transformation right now where for the largest companies, learners are more often online than they are in the, in the classroom. And you're working out that journey for yourselves and for your organizations. So big job and a good job. It's, you're, you're ahead. The employees, so we started to recognize that even in the best situations, in the, in the best companies where culture of learning was visibly happening and the L&D development department was delivering on the things that the employees were asking for, they weren't always engaging at the levels that you, you would expect. And we start to think th about this as the thing that we, we probably want to disrupt the most, that, that engagement. Why aren't people actively learning every day, every week, improving their skills, given that we've started to understand the importance and started to have a view into the, the skills gap, whether it's soft skills or just the thing you need to do to be productive and solve your problem today. So why not? Well, first of all, we start to look at what's the employee base. And we, we heard it again today about the different generations that exist within every organization's demog uh, demographic. And we know that by 2025, mill millennials will make up 75% of the workforce, will be the majority, the vast majority. The thing with the millennial workforce is, I don't feel that particularly different. I am certainly not a millennial, but I don't feel particularly different to a millennial in the sense that you know, I always have my phone, I'm connected uh, digitally, I'm always mobile, I'm always looking for, for um, application of technology, I'm used to it. A couple of things that are certainly different for the, the millennial generation though is one, they are statistically more likely to have a side gig or a side hustle, means another job, something else which engages them as much as the job that they do, or maybe not as much, but they are likely to have something else going on the side that they're passionate about as well as the job in the office. And the other, the other thing is that it's likely that it's statistically more likely compared with other generations that their first proper professional job is their first job and they didn't work part-time before. M many, many did. Many worked part-time, but statistically more likely for that to be the case. So now we start to think about what skills would be important there and how might they engage. Really important in terms of how we activate learning, though, is that they are more likely, not much more likely, I mean, non-millennials, as you see here, also care about their own development as it, go, as it relates to career, but they're more likely to care about development as it relates to the career as other aspects that they might care about in their job, like financial gains or other benefits. In fact, 94% of them said they'd stay at a company longer if it seemed that that company cared about their career development. And yet, conflicting 
the number one reason people are, are held back from learning is still they don't have enough time. They don't, have, don't make enough time. What they told us then when we asked the question directly, what would lead you to spend more time learning at workplace skills? It relates to the manager. So it relates to that first line manager level, which we're starting to think is maybe not activated enough. So if you look at the, the statistics here, the manager directed the, the learning. It was related to some kind of a promotion. Peer recommended is that, that first level, so social learning engagement, and I discuss and, and we learn together in a, in a group in, or, in order to, to move forward. And then executives at the bottom, um, executives knew who was learning and that, that my learning is visible, so that's the, the top sponsorship. Still important, but the top is that the manager directed the learning, suggested the learning, modeled, was a role model that learning is good and can be related to the career. So okay, we start to understand that manager, manager involvement, this first layer involvement is gonna be critical. And then we found the challenge for L and number two challenge for L&D directors, apart from this engagement thing, is that it was hard to get managers involved in employee learning. So okay. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. First of all, let's look at executives at the, at the top of that, th those layers that I suggested. The sponsorship from, for executives, we all know it's important that we need executive spon sponsorship and we need modeling at that level. But what do the executives think about learning and development? Well, other good news, completely aligned on this soft skill idea with the L&D department completely aligned that we need to future-proof the organization by building soft skills because we know that, yes, we have digital transformation, but that's not just about the, the digital technology tools. There's this whole list of critical thinking, communication, uh, creativity that we need to, to look after. And the reason we need to look after those soft skills, resilience, all of the, the things that are, that are um, adaptable is because the pace of the core of the, the, the roles are changing so rapidly that to change, to be able to change, to have that foundation is almost more important than any specific one skill, which is why we have program or platform usage near, near the bottom. So really, a good, good strong alignment, but but where we found for the talent developers um, that identifying trends for future skills gaps, all the future skills gaps in your industry, was number six. For executives, this was number two. So a misalignment in terms of the balance of solving, a problem for, solving problems for, for today and making sure that we have the skills gaps covered for the shorter term versus being that strategic advisor for the future and building for the future. This is what the executives need. Great news is that for talent developers as a, as a profession, I think that you've never been more important and potentially more impactful. We're having a conversation at lunch about in my grandfather's generation, you think about finance as a function. It was an accounting person with this uh, green, hat, green hat on, and they're sitting in the, in the basement probably doing the accounting. And during the course of that generation, finance became more impactful and more important in any operation until you get to the CFO at the C-suite impacting every strategy. And then in my father's generation, there was the advent of technology and computing, and the, it was the IT team were executing, but they were, they, when finance moved out, they went into the, into the basement. And in that generation, they became more impactful and more important in the strategy of any operation until we got this CIO at the C-suite table. And then in our generation, we see the rise of importance 
of um, talent. You see, the organizations who want to progress and deliver on whatever they, their mission is, they will win or lose based on winning teams and win or lose based on, on talent. And so we see the advent of CHRO and CLO. And so in terms of a career that you could choose, which is incredibly impactful, not on just individuals that you work with and that you, that you can empower, but for the organization and the organization's mission, I don't think there is one that, that's, that's more impactful. And the executives think that as well. It's just that we still have that misalignment somehow in terms of the now versus, and the balance of planning for the future, future proofing and bridging those skills gaps. And this is what the executives told us that they're looking for from the learning and development organization, the biz to, to connect to the business outcomes, the business challenges, and for uh, job performance, of course. All right, let's just go back to the people managers for, for the moment. So are the people managers the missing link to, to driving this engagement? We asked them. First of all, great news, all the people managers deeply value L&D as well, as well as the executives. They know that a culture of, of learning is important, that it can save time, close skills gap, and help the employees grow and therefore be more engaged, be more likely to stay, be more likely to be, to be uh, productive. So okay, well, if you know all that, why are you not already activated as one of the influencers for, for learning and development? So we asked them, we asked, what would motivate you to encourage learning? If I go from the bottom up this time, first one, if they were asked by more senior managers, okay, <laughs> makes sense. Second, that the learning opportunities were structured and obvious, that there was learning where the teams could go at their own pace, that they could see and measure job performance, that they were helped, that there was a system that could help them to be able to help their employee, and again, if learning was really completely tied to the path to promotion. So at this point, I think um, for the, with the managers, it's a matter of habits, developing habits. The best way to develop habits, if you ever try to develop a habit, let's take, for example, um, flossing your teeth. The best way to develop the habit of flossing your teeth is to identify or link it to another habit that's already happening. Probably, in this case, brushing your teeth. So I make brushing the teeth the trigger to I'm always gonna floss my teeth. I'm not doing something completely new and completely different, but I'm connecting the two and I know I have a trigger and I already have a habit ingrained. And the first time I floss my teeth, I just do five seconds and that's a win, I count it. Second day, I just do two teeth and that's a win, I count it. Third day, five teeth, another victory. Now I'm putting a, a streak together. I don't want to miss the fourth day because now, now, it's, now it's happening. This is psychologically the best way to build a habit. And if I think about a manager's life and interaction with an employee, I am doing one-to-ones, hopefully coaching, team meetings. I am doing performance management. I am having correct conversation about career, I am helping them to solve a problem, and these are the triggers that we need to activate the managers to use in order to make the recommendations of the learning that could unlock potential, help the employees to, to grow. It doesn't have to be LinkedIn learning, it can be any learning, I recommend LinkedIn learning, it can be any learning, and this is the manager not as the the formatter, as Dr. Varan said with that, the, the tool, reformatting and putting somebody in the box, but this is the manager as a, a coach and an inspirer. And the employee can learn and develop, not constrained by what the manager knows or does not know, but is encouraged to go and find their way to use, to use their mind. So again, Executives, important. L&D, super important. Social selling and peer recommendations together. But this activation of the management layer 
is the habit that might unlock engagement and might disrupt, disrupt engagement for you. OK, so just go back to the uh, economic graph for a moment. What that economic graph gives us with 550 million people and tens of thousands of companies and hundreds of thousands of jobs and tens of thousands of school and billions of knowledge exchanges underlaying, overlaying all of that is a lot of data. And we are nerds with the data because we are trying to draw out these insights that we can, that we can share with you. For example, if we look at the manufacturing industry, I think this is maybe a little hard to, to see, but on the right-hand side, you see the current in-demand skills in the manufacturing industry as measured by keywords in jobs that are posted on LinkedIn. So we know they're on dem in-demand skills because they feature in, in jobs. On the left-hand side, though, you see the fastest growing skills in the same industry. And that's measured by the keywords that people are adding for themselves on the profiles or the words that are showing up in job descriptions at a faster rate than the job uh, descriptions that existed already. On the right-hand side, these skills are extremely important and they're not going away. Management, Excel, sales, they are foundational and they're not going away. But for you as talent development professionals, to be able to be impactful and to help the executive with what they're asking for, which is to have a advisory position of what do we need to look out for the future, you need to take a, a look at what are the fastest growing skills and see, and see how you can, you can compare. And interesting, there are a ton, just so happens that in manufacturing, there are a ton of the technology type skills, but you also see things like resilience and handling pressure and those, those softer skills, the ones that the robots will never do. So we build these into the tools. Here you see a picture of what it looks like if you're an admin on LinkedIn Learning. You can see the skills inventory in your organization based on the indication of the LinkedIn data, you know, people who are members in your organization but are on LinkedIn, and how that compares with the, the industry benchmark. So that instead of executing, you're now making uh, recommendations. You can find this uh, 2018 workplace report, the one that I used for some of these um, insights. You can uh, find it on LinkedIn. I'm just summarizing here the, the, the key insights that we found and that we discussed today. So softening the impact of automa uh, automation, it means this idea of soft skills that we talked about today. Balancing today with tomorrow as a, as a professional community, understanding the opportunity and the complexity of the digital solutions that you need to, to work across. Reduce time, uh, reduce friction so that employees can find time. And I think possibly most importantly, amplifying your relationships with the managers so that you can switch on that layer and help them to create habits that will help their employees to, to thrive through learning. <clears throat> if you want to know more and you've got an iPhone, you can take a picture of this and it will take you to LinkedIn Learning site so you can have a look at it. If, you, if that doesn't work, you haven't got your phone handy, you can talk to me afterwards. I'm also here with my friend and colleague, Sadat. Uh, we're very happy to answer questions and help you to explore LinkedIn Learning. Thank you.